All right. Um, we are able to offer some of this programming um, um, in part due to our wonderful members and donors. Uh, Peak will send you an evaluation form after this talk. Um, I know everyone gets surveys and ignores them, but we really appreciate it if you can uh, fill that out for us and we can use your uh, comments to improve future programs. Um, we will be taking questions via Zoom chat. Um, type any of your questions in there, and then at the end we can ask Joyce any questions that we have there. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joyce, and she is going to talk to us about the Delta Scooty Stars tonight. So Joyce. Thank, Thank you, you for Elizabeth. doing that. And um, if my if my audio starts to cut out, I'm going to leave my video on. But if my audio is getting choppy, please break in and let me know, and I will turn it off. And maybe that will help um, with the bandwidth. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining me. I'm going to take you on a little tour of some of the research I've done this fall uh, up until mid-November on high amplitude delta scuti stars. And as you know, I work on many different types of variable stars and I have during my entire career, kind of as a side sideline at the lab, my PhD was in uh, pulsating variable stars and, and modeling the sun. And I've just kept doing it along with my lab work um, with my students um, over, over the last 30 years. So I'm Joyce Guzik, as Elizabeth said, uh, this, this um, presentation has several co-authors, and some of these I've never met in person, at least one of them, Richard Wagner, uh, and I'll introduce you a little bit to him later. He's an observer in Ontario, uh, Canada, and he took data in his, with his telescope either in his yard or nearby his, his house. And he contacted my second co-author here, Karen Kinamuchi, who was working at, New Mex uh, at Apache Peak Observatory near New Mexico State and said, I have all this data, what can I do with it? And so she, con because it was Delta Scuti stars, she contacted me and I said, well, okay, I can try to help with some modeling. And so this, the next few people are my, my current, one of my current grad students who knows about stellar modeling. Um, one of my uh, retired colleagues, another new student at the lab, and another new colleague at the lab who all helped me to uh, learn a new um, open source stellar evolution code to try to uh, begin modeling these stars. So it, it research is often done this way. You meet people and they introduce you to other people and then you start collaborating. So that's kind of what happened with this talk. Um, go on to the next one. So during my career over the, um, actually since the 1970s, we've been learning more and more about variable stars. And we found that stars of nearly every type and every evolutionary state show some variability in, um, and some of them, many of them pulsate either in radial or non-radial modes. And this diagram doesn't even have all of the pulsating variable star types anymore because they keep adding more of them. So I need to update this slide, but this is a plot of the luminosity or brightness of stars on, on the y-axis versus the surface temperature of stars on the x-axis. And the hotter stars are off here to the left and the cooler stars are to the right. And this dashed line here is where stars begin their lifetime burning hydrogen into helium in their cores like our sun. This is called the main sequence. So the sun in this picture is down here. And the stars I'm going to talk about are a little bit more massive than the sun. Uh, the delta scuti variable stars, about, about twice the mass of the sun, are up here. And they're actually starting to evolve off of the main sequence and become giants, as you'll see. And then there's the gamma door stars um, a little bit below that between the sun and the solar like stars. So one of the things I did in 1984 is I attended my first meeting of the American Association of Variable Star Observers. And I never attended another meeting with them until around 2015 when uh, they, they invited me to give a talk. And then they uh, later on, I became a member of their board. So this is an organization that's been around for 111 years now. And their mission is, to, it's a nonprofit. Their mission is to enable anyone anywhere to participate in scientific discovery through variable star astronomy. And they have many different resources that um, so you, some of them you don't even have to join the organization to get. 
Um, you can get data from them. You can submit data to them from data that you've taken yourself. You can take some classes um, that they offer about how to analyze the data. Um, and you can do educational outreach and, and other other things with them. So I've been a member of this for a while now, and this was my last year on the board of this organization. And I attended the 111th meeting in Tucson this November. So this is the group photo. I am stuck way here in the center, squinting in the sun. And at this meeting, I was able to meet for the first time my two remote graduate students at New Mexico State and New Mexico Tech who are here and back here. Um, and I also was able to see my friend David Esper, who I had um, attended that meeting in 1984 with at Iowa State. And I'd seen him a little more recently, like 25 years ago, but now he lives in Tucson. So he came to visit with us um, over dinner one day. So this is a picture of me at, you know, at the balcony at sunset with the moon rising. So it was really beautiful to go there and these people in this, this uh, meeting are both professional astronomers and amateur astronomers. And you can see there's a wide range of, of um, ages and people from actually all over the world here. So it was a really nice experience. So I wanted to give a paper at this meeting. I wanted to be able to give a talk. So I talked with Richard Wagner and Karen and we organized that we would do this um, talk that I'm giving you a little bit longer version of today about the data that Richard Wagner collected in Ontario, Canada. So I'm going to start a little bit by telling you what it means for a star to pulsate. I'm saying pulsating variable stars. Uh, so what it means is that a star is changing its size or its shape or its brightness with some steady period. It's it's either moving in and out or it's it's I'll give you some more analogies. Um, so the surface of the star could be moving up and down, or the surface surface of the star could even be just sloshing back and forth. So the pulsation periods of stars on that first diagram I showed you, they can range from a minute, very short periods, to a year, very over a year in some cases, very long periods. So if you want to get a full cycle of observations, you may have to spend over a year looking periodically at a particular star to get the full brightness change, or with some kinds of stars, you can get many brightness changes just in one night of observations. So um, this is something that amateurs can do. So these are just some analogies of, of pulsation, trying to think of things you might encounter in your life that are like a pulsation or like a vibration, uh, a bell ringing, vibrations on a string, a pipe organ, the swing in this picture, like a pendulum going back and forth, uh, water in a bucket, sloshing back and forth, or jello jiggling, breathing as you breathe in, your lungs expand, and as you breathe out, they contract, or even a ball bouncing. It goes down and then it goes up and slows down, and then it comes down from gravity and bounces and comes back up again. So, those are all kinds of analogies or pictures, maybe you can have in your head that can tell you about some aspect of stars pulsating. So the sun and other variable stars, we've learned, oops, recently, um, oscillate can oscillate in many oscillation modes at one time, like different overtones or harmonics on a musical instrument. So this is a picture of a bell. And on the, um, the three pictures here are Doppler grams where they're showing the vibrations in certain patches of the bell at certain frequencies. So if when this bell is ringing, it can be ringing in all three of these modes at once. Um, but if you can isolate certain frequencies, like this lower frequency one, you see there are fewer patches here moving in and out. And those lines here that are steady are called node lines. And as you go up to higher frequency, you get more and more patches vibrating and more and more of these node lines. So the sun is actually vibrating in many thousands of modes that kind of come and go, like, like if you ring a bell and then it damps out and you ring it again and it, damp and it rings for a while and then damps out, the sun oscillates like that. So other kinds of stars have different ways that the um, modes get excited. There's different mechanisms inside the star that cause the, the pulsation. Um, and the stars I'm going to talk to you mostly about today are the Delta Scuti and the Gamma Dor variable stars that also pulsate like the sun in many modes simultaneously. 
So the Delta Scuti stars, as I said before, are about twice the mass of the sun. They pulsate in acoustic mode or sound mode pulsations, but we can't hear them from the earth because there's no air between us and the star. And they're also at such a low frequency, but they wouldn't be in our hearing range. You'd have to bump them up like 20,000 times in frequency to be able to, to get them in the, um, the, the mode that are in the frequencies that our ears could hear. And their periods are about two hours. So if you watched one of these stars over a couple hours, if it had a, a big enough brightness variation, you could get several cycles of data in just one night. So the gamma door stars are a little bit different. They're, they're pulsating from gravity mode pulsations. So the restoring force here is gravity. So they're more like water waves or more like that ball bouncing. Um, their periods are longer, one to three days. So if you looked at this all night, you might get part of a period, one of these stars, you wouldn't see the full picture. So space-based observations where they can look 24 hours have really helped in, in finding more of these gamma doradus variable stars. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is, um, I, in my title was High Amplitude Delta Scuti Stars. And this has always been a sort of a separate class of Delta Scuti stars, but now we're thinking maybe it's not really that separate. It's really just an arbitrary line. Although there are some characteristics that I've that I will show you that are do make these a little bit unique. So these are usually, but not always, post-main sequence stars. They finish the the um, burning of hydrogen in their core, and they're starting to go on their way to become red giants. And so they have a, an inert helium core that's not burning, uh, not fusing helium because it's not hot enough yet. And there's a hydrogen burning shell around the core and um, their spectral type, I don't know if you know it's um, OBA, FGKM, maybe you've learned this in astronomy class, uh, the different uh, letters are refer to different temperatures, but these are temperatures of around 6,000 to 8,000 degrees at the surface of the star. Their masses are one and a half to two and a half solar masses. And what another thing that's kind of unique about them is they don't pulsate in a lot of different modes like the bell. They usually only pulsate in one or two modes. The fundamental mode where the whole surface is coming out and in um, together, or the first overtone mode where the surface is coming out and in, but there's some place inside the star that's going in the opposite direction in and out while the top outer part is going out and in. So it has kind of one node position inside the star. So usually there are one or two modes and that's all. And their periods are a few hours. And this seems a little bit arbitrary because different people define it different ways, but their amplitudes, their brightness changes are, are big compared to regular Delta Scuti stars or the sun. They can be um, 0.15 visual magnitudes um, change. So if you were an observer with a small telescope and just looking at data, you could pick up the brightness change pretty easily in a high amplitude Delta Scuti star. So this is a picture of the visual magnitude change versus time with a lot of, a lot of um, points just stacked on each other so you could see the, the brightness go up and down and up and down. And this star I'll talk about later. It's these stars that I'm gonna talk about today are pretty faint. You really need a telescope to look at them. We can usually only see uh, sixth magnitude stars. Um, the lower the number, the brighter the star. So sixth magnitude or great or smaller numbers is what we can see. But for visual, this visual magnitude is 13. So it's way fainter than we could see um, with our naked eye. So I wanted to show you a little more about an analogy again of a fundamental or a first overtone mode. And you can kind of think about them like vibrations on a string so or a jump rope even. So here's a fundamental mode uh, string pulsation. So you have um, only the whole string is either going up or down together and there are no nodes in the center here. So um, you could kind of think of the star, like if you slice through this, the top part of the star, the surface would be going up and then down. But then if you do a first overtone mode, you have one mode in the center, one node, excuse me, in the center. And if you slice through here, the top of the star might be going up and then down and up and down, but the inside of the star will be going the opposite direction. It'll go down and then up. 
following this dashed line. So, and second overtone is here too. There are second overtone pulsators too, but they're, they're usually rarer than fundamental and first overtone. So why do we even care about these pulsations? Why, you know, these stars are out there pulsating, so what? Well, they do tell us a lot about physics and what we're, what we're getting right and what we're not getting right in our, in our modeling. And this kind of modeling can apply to other situations like fusion energy or, um, or some of the work we do at the lab. So it's, it's important to understand if, we, if our physics models are adequate to explain what's going on inside stars. So these pulsations give us information about the sun and distant stars and planets even that we could not obtain otherwise. Um, they'll tell us what is uh, more about what is going on inside the star where we can't see, we can only see the surface. And what is the mass and radius of the star? We can't measure that from just looking at the star. It's just a point of light up there. Um, we can measure its brightness if we know its distance, but we can't measure its size and how heavy the star is. Like, well, if you have some planets going around it, you probably could get a better idea. Um, and it'll tell, and these models also could tell us roughly what is the age of the star, which again might be important if you want to understand. Uh, solar system or, pl or planet exoplanet evolution, how, um, how planets formed around stars like, like our sun, how long have they been there? Um, you kind of need to know the age of the star to be able to understand that. Okay, so the four stars we're going to visit a little bit today that Richard Wagner sent me data for are the 1965 Aquila, LS, SETI, RV, RE, and the star DDE-148. And here you see these light curves again that, that are from not Richard Wagner, but from another uh, source, um, the supernova search, where they basically were just taking data points every once in a while looking for supernovae, and these stars happened to be in the field of view. And so they, they recorded their brightness, and then they just threw all the points together and made a phased light curve. So these are nice visuals to see what the stars are doing. Um, so you see they're 12, 13, 11th magnitude. They're all too faint to, to really see. Um, some of these though have a very well-defined light curve when you've folded it on its period. And um, some of these are kind of ragged. And the ragged ones probably have more than one pulsation mode going on at one time. It's just folded around the main one but there are probably several modes going on at once here. And um, likewise with this one, I think there's definitely more than one mode. And you'll see later, this one does, has more than one mode too. So one of the things I find curious is how do we get these crazy names for these variable stars? So I looked this up on Wikipedia. I used to know this a long time ago, um, but the brightest stars in constellations um, they're named by Greek, by the, first starting with a Greek letter, like Alpha, Beta, Delta, in order of brightness in the constellation, and then followed by the constellation name. So like Alpha Centauri or um, Delta Cephei is a, is a bright Cepheid variable. Um, and then after they, um, they discovered variable stars, they thought they were pretty rare. Um, and they started to use the letters R through Z. The person who came up with this scheme, by the way, is Friedrich Arla Argelander, who was lived in 1799 to 1875, and his picture is over here. Uh, so he, they thought variable stars at that time were very rare, and they weren't going to use up all these letters. So they started with R. Um, and they went up R through Z in each constellation. But then they ran out of letters. So then they started going back to RR and RS, RT, et cetera, to RZ, and then back SR, SS, ST to SZ, et cetera, to the end of the alphabet. But then they ran out of letters there too. So then they started back at the letter A and they went AA, AB to QZ, and they omitted the letter J. And I think this has something to do with the uh, German language and ambiguity, and that's why it got omitted. Um, and you never have in this scheme a second letter earlier than the first, so there won't be any Bs, BAs. They'll always go, the second letter is always higher. And then after all, they exhausted all these, they had 334 combinations. 
they abandoned this and started just putting V for variable star and numbering. So the next one after that is V33, V335, V336, et cetera, in the constellation. So this is the story if you're wondering where these names came from. And nowadays with space missions, there are so many thousands of variable stars that usually they just name the star after the catalog that the star is found in and that it was discovered in. So many stars have multiple names depending on how many catalogs they're, they're, they have an entry in. So this is um, a picture of this observer that I've never met except corresponding by email, Richard Wagner, and he lives in Elgin, Ontario. And this is the telescope he used, looks like he's living by a lake uh, to take this picture. Uh, to take to take this data rather um, for for these stars, and he's using a 0.25 meter Schmidt Newtonium telescope, and he's got a camera, a CCD camera on it. So 0.25 meters is about I don't know nine and a half inch telescope. And uh, after taking pictures, he has to reduce the data, um, yeah, and he uses all this software is available online. Uh, this is a Python package, AstroPy, that he reduced the pictures to get magnitudes. And in order to get magnitudes, you have to compare the varying star with a star that's constant or mostly constant in the same picture. So that's what he did to get the absolute magnitudes. And then he used an, another piece of software called period four to figure out what the pulsation frequencies um, and the pulsation amplitudes are for these four stars. And he's looked at many, many more stars, but these were just the four he sent me for this paper, you have to start somewhere. And I say there's thousands of Delta Scuti stars. There's probably hundreds of high amplitude Delta Scuti stars. And where do you start? Um, those are just the known ones. There's probably many more we haven't even discovered yet. So have to start somewhere. So we started with these four. So he would go out and take data for an, a night or whenever it was clear. And these vertical lines basically are one night of observing for him. Um, and over about 70 days, you can see there's several nights of observing going on. And during one night, you can get, because the periods are a couple of hours, you can get most of a pulsation cycle. So here, he's, this is one of these uh, days, um, less than a day, a few hours. You see there's most of a, of a Delta Scuti pulsation cycle that he's gotten a very accurate light curve for. Um, and all of this data is combined together and analyzed to get the periods of the star. Let's see, and I, I'm using B magnitude here. So he has a couple of different filters. One of them is blue and one of them looks in the visual. And if you take the data in several different filters, you can get some information about the temperature of the surface of the star over time and also help with identifying which pulsation mode it's pulsating in. So we haven't made use of much of that data yet, but he's also taken data in a couple of different colors, blue and visual. And this is V1965 Aquila in the constellation Aquila the Eagle. All right, so after getting this data, we use that, um, he used that period four program to figure out what um, periods there are, what frequencies there are. And he found a fundamental mode frequency, which was the um, highest amplitude, actually 0.27 in B magnitude. This is a pretty high amplitude Delta Scuti star. But um, we looked for more different modes and there were no other modes there. All there were were multiples of that fundamental mode. So 7, 14, 21, 29, these are just exact multiples of that fundamental mode frequency. So this star seems to just have one pulsation mode. And that seems kind of unusual to me now after every Delta Scuti star I looked at with space data has more modes. But we were lucky because in, well, this is a picture from the ASAS survey, the supernova survey that I showed before. You see it's a pretty tight light curve. So they don't see a whole lot of modes there either. This is a ground-based survey using 24 inch telescopes. But we were lucky because this star had test data from space. So TESS uh, satellite, transiting exoplanet survey satellite, was used, it's being used now to find planets around other stars. As they go in front of the star, they block some of the light and eclipse the star a little. And we can pick that up and figure out how many, well, that there's a planet there and how many there are. Um, 
And this has been up since April 2018. And it can look at a target for up to 27 days um, in an observing session. But if it's in the right place in the sky, it can look, it was looking continuously um, near the North and South ecliptic pole. And it takes a data point every two minutes. So you can get a really accurate light curve if you're looking at the stars. So TESS is in an interesting orbit. When it was launched, they launched it toward the moon and they used the moon to give it an assist. And it's in an elliptical orbit, um, kind of angled with the moon's orbit around the earth. Here's the earth, here's the moon. So the orbit is kind of angled and every half lunar orbit it rendezvous with the moon, and that gives it a little bit of a push, so it keeps it in a resonance orbit. So it keeps going around once every 13.7 days, interacting with the moon to keep it in that orbit. So it needs very little fuel to keep it um, positioned, um, doesn't drift drift off into space. So that's that's been a really nice feature of this spacecraft. So in July, af actually after we decided to look at the star, um, TESS observed the star for 27 days um, and it was in sector 54. So this is the strip of sky that TESS was observing in uh, for 27 days starting in July 9th. And the star is down in here um, in this part of the strip of sky. So it only got 27 days, but that's enough compared to our ground-based one. So again, we learned about some software online, more, more Python software. We took an AAVSO tutorial to help us analyze the data from TESS. And this is what a little piece of the 27-day light curve looked like. You see it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. Um, this is a relative magnitude, so it's not absolute. But then we did the periodogram to try to look at what the frequencies were, and we didn't find and other frequencies, except that fundamental mode, which is really strange. We found the, that seven cycles per day, um, or this is a different unit microhertz, and the multiples of that, and nothing else, which, as I say, is very unusual for a Delta Scuti star. Usually you find more frequencies than one, but that's all there is, even in this test data. Maybe if we look longer, or at a different time, or in 10 years, we'll see something else, but that's the way it is right now. Okay, and then we looked um, We looked at some other data by um, Richard Wagner. This is LS SETI, and here he's taken uh, data in both visual and blue magnitude. And again, this is only, well, it's about 70, 60, 70 days of data, but spaced because it's cloudy sometimes. You can't get data every night. And he only found one frequency for this one too at 11.86 cycles per day. Now, here's the ASAS survey that has more points, and you can see there's a lot of scatter, so there might be more frequencies here, but we couldn't find them in Richard's data. Uh, this is the star RV Ari, and this star is very well studied by many people, not just um, by us, so I'm not sure how much we can contribute to the literature on this star, but here's Richard's data, and he finds the fundamental mode, he finds twice the fundamental mode, but he also finds the first overtone mode. This is just labeled F2 here um, and combinations of those. So that's to be expected if there are two modes, but there are also other modes in the star. There's some that aren't combinations of the fundamental or first overtone. Maybe those are some of those non-radial kind of sloshing modes that I was talking to you about at the beginning that a lot of Delta Scuti stars show. And this particular mode, is really low frequency. It's under five cycles per day. Um, this could even be a gamma doradus pulsation mode. So this star has a lot of modes and they can give us more clues for our modeling, more constraints for our modeling to try to understand uh, what's going on inside this star. And here's the phase light curve. You see a lot of scatter from this uh, assassin survey. And that is what we expect if there are lots of modes there. Um, contaminating the single period going on. And then finally, there's the star that is not named because uh, by the usual naming convention, DDE-148. And that's because it was discovered by Denis Denisenko, who I believe is in Russia. Um, and he has his own catalog. So he just started numbering all stars that he discovered that variable. So this is just named DDE-148. 
And this is Richard's data again. And this star also seems to have, um, it has the fundamental mode, it has the first overtone, the F2, it has combinations, and it has one mode that's got some really low frequency, could be a gamma door mode. So this is not as rich in pulsation modes, and it isn't very well studied at all. So this might be one where we could um, we could make a contribution to the literature that no one has made before by doing some um, some modeling of this star. And this is the phase light curve, so it isn't quite as um, scattered. Uh, but it does have two modes and then maybe one more. Okay, so the next part of my talk, I'm going to talk about um, starting to do some modeling uh, on computers of these stars, of their evolution and of their pulsation. And again, this is something that amateurs can now do. So to get started with this, I need some starting points. I need to know approximately what mass should I start with, approximately what temperature am I aiming for, and to get this information, I decided to use something I was pretty familiar with, the TESS input catalog. Where it's a catalog of lots of stars that you could look through to pick out ones that you want to target for observations by the TESS spacecraft. So each of these stars has a TESS input catalog number. And I did show you the observations of this star, which were done in that sector, sector 54. RV Ari has also been looked at by TESS and LS SETI, but the data hasn't really been analyzed. And DDE 148 so far has not been looked at by TESS. So you can get some idea of the temperature in Kelvin, six, six or 7,000 from the star. The masses, these are estimated just from the brightness and typical stars of that, of this spectral type. It's not very accurate. So we hope that pulsation modeling will give you a better number on the mass and on the radius of the star. And luminosity, you can get a little bit better idea because you know how bright it is. We have the Gaia spacecraft that tells us the parallax of this of the star, and that tells us how far away it is from the um, how much it moves as the as the spacecraft is orbiting in the solar system. Um, when it changes its position, the star will appear to shift relative to further away stars. Um, and they were able to do that with this and get some um, parallaxes. And you can see the stars. These stars are pretty far away. It's probably why they're so faint. They're 1290 parsecs. So that's 3.2 light years per parsec. So this is uh, several thousand light years away. So these stars are not close by. But um, the, this catalog gave me some starting points. So I was able to put these stars on, a, on the diagram, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, just like the diagram you saw in the first slide, where you know you can look at the brightness of the star versus its temperature. And I remember the hotter ones are over on the left side and the cooler on the right. And then I've also added the Delta Scuti instability strip, where we expect Delta Scuti stars to pulsate, and the Gamma Dor instability strip. So if we put these four stars on the diagram, we see that they're all pretty far off the main sequence, kind of like you expect for high amplitude Delta Scuti stars. They probably uh, have finished or about to finish their hydrogen core burning, and they're burning hydrogen in a shell, and then they're going to go off to the right here and become red giants. And we also see that they're kind of on the, the right edge of the Delta Scuti instability strip. They're in the Delta Scuti instability strip, so we expect them to be Delta Scuti stars, but they're also close or in the Gamma Dor instability strip. So having one or more of those low um, frequency modes, like the 0.6 um, cycles per day or that four cycles per day, that isn't that that is not out of the question. That's something we probably would expect because of how close they are to being within the gamma door or actually are in the gamma door instability strip. So the code I'm going to be using uh, that I kind of had to relearn because they keep coming up with a new version of the code um, every every year or two. Uh, it's called Mesa Modules for Experiments in Stellar Astrophysics, and it's an open source code written by Bill Paxton, and lately um, his successors have taken it on, and Adam German has written the last um, update to this code, or written the last paper on the updates to the code. Um, it has a new capability as of 2019 to actually calculate the radial pulsations of stellar envelopes, just like our Delta Scuti stars. And there are a few examples in the paper of trying to model Delta Scuti stars. They're not easy to model, as I learned. 
um, but there are many tutorials and examples available on the web on their website. And I installed this on my desktop computer at work with help from my collaborators and on my laptop, uh, the one I'm using right now. So I'm able to use this code um, just from home if I want. And this is the web the web page for Mesa. So you can go there. It'll tell you about how to quick start, how to install it. There's a bunch of there's a test suite where you can run any any of the examples and see watch the star evolve. Um, lots of documentation, and there's a, even a kind of a blog you can subscribe to where you'll, you can ask questions and get updates. So what I did was try to model first this RV 1965 Aquila, which had, um, it was up here in this box in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and the other three stars were lower in luminosity, but I decided to go with this one first. This is the one that had the one single period with not showing nothing else, and I evolved a 1.9 solar mass star with MESA. Um, this is the pre-main sequence as the star is starting to contract, um, and it's going to go over here, where right here, where it's going to start burning hydrogen in the core, and then it's going to evolve off uh, this way to the right. And then it's exhausted core hydrogen, and it's going to contract, and it has this inert helium core, and now it's starting to burn hydrogen in a shell as it goes across this way. So I, I tried a bunch of different masses, and this is the mass that got close, 1.9, to where the star's position was in this diagram. And then I moved the star around and tried to find where where would it be to have exactly that pulsation period that we observed um, in the data that Richard took and that we also found in tests? So it turned out that a star right here on this track has those properties. It's, it's within the error bars of the luminosity and temperature, and it has the right pulsation period. So, um, and that, that star happened to, well, as I say, it had 1.9 solar masses, and it actually, um, the age of the star, according to Mesa, is 1.4 billion years old. So it's, our sun is 4.6 billion years old, so it's only about a quarter of the age of the sun. But those two things I could not get just by looking at the star. You have to do some stellar modeling to, to figure that out. And if I looked in that test input catalog, their, their estimate was, I think, a bit off. It's one point, their estimate was 1.5 plus or minus 0.26 solar masses, so quite a bit lower than what I needed. Now, there are other parameters in MESA I could vary to see if I could get a lower mass model. I could start the star with a lower um, uh, metallicity, lower amount of heavy elements. I could start it with a I think, uh, I don't know if I have to go up or down in helium, I could try to add some extra mixing into the star. So maybe I could find models with lower masses, but that still satisfy, satisfy the other constraints. The problem with this star though, that I found with this with this star is that it is, does predict that fundamental mode is gonna be unstable. It's gonna start pulsating, but it also says the first overtone is gonna pulsate. And in fact, that one is going to grow and overtake the fundamental mode, according to this model. Um, and we don't see that. We just see the fundamental mode pulsating. So it isn't right. It isn't perfect. There's more that has to be learned. So then I use this MESA RSP program um, just to model the velocity of the surface as it goes up and down. And this is a problem with these stars because they have such small growth rates that you have to run it for many, many, many cycles before it stops growing and reaches a limiting amplitude. So I ran this when I, at the time of the conference, I'd only run it for 27 days of star age or a few thousand cycles. And it, um, I kicked it at about 25 kilometers per second. And here it's made it up to 30 kilometers per second, but it still didn't have a big enough amplitude to match the observation. And I'm, I'm still running it today. It's getting closer a month later to actually converging, but it's taking a long time. It's staying in the fundamental mode, but that first overtone is still in there. So there's this model is not correct. So you see, uh, this is 460 star days and 3,300 3, periods. Um, you see a little bit of a bump in the light curve. This is from that first overtone that's trying to sneak in and take over. 
And you see the, um, it's about 0.2 magnet, no, 0.3 magnitudes. It needs to be a little bit bigger. So it's made it up to 40 kilometers per second, but it has a ways to go yet. So one of the other things I learned by reading the Mesa paper is that you have to run Delta Scuti stars for a really long time in this, in this uh, RSP model. So they ran their star here for 250,000 cycles. I only ran mine 3,300 in that last picture. And the result, these are hard to understand. I don't expect you to understand them. The result is sensitive to initial conditions kind of like chaos theory, or you've heard about weather, you know, if the butterfly uh, flaps its wings here, then the weather, you get a hurricane in China, you know, five years later, because it's just varying something way over here can make something different happen over here because of nonlinear effects and chaos. So depending on how they started their model, it either converged to first overtone, like mine is, I thought mine was gonna do, or it kind of wandered over and is trying to head towards fundamental mode and it's not there yet. So I'm not sure what to do about this. Depending on how you start it, you can end up with a different answer. And this is a research problem. I'm not sure what I can do with it. So this is um, my summary. And as you can tell from just my talk so far, there's a lot more to do. Uh, there is more photometry available. Richard is taking more. There are satellite data, uh, test data, uh, more ground-based data that we could use. We can do multicolor photometry. We could, um, uh, some of these stars may be eclipsing binaries, although we can't see any evidence because maybe we're just not catching the eclipse. So longer observations are needed. Uh, we only modeled one star here. There's three more that we looked at we could model. Um, I could calculate predictions for some of the other modes that we see in the stars. And I'm just wondering if I'm ever going to be able to run enough cycles to actually get a, a solution for these things. So, so there's plenty of work to do. Um, okay, so I think I'm finished. I guess I should stop sharing and then I can take questions. All right, thanks Joyce. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, I think we're a small enough group here that probably um, you can just unmute and ask Joyce uh, your question directly. Hi, Joyce, it's Galen. Um, can, um, I was wondering if, um, if Delta Scuti stars like Cepheids are at all useful for, um, for distance um, calibrations? Um, yes, they aren't as bright. They're quite a bit, so they're not going to be very useful for other galaxies, but for around our gal uh, galaxy, yes. And um, yesterday I listened to a talk at the TESS Science Conference online where um, a grad student has just done a recalibration um, of, a, of a period luminosity relationship for Delta Scuti stars. The pro one of the problems is you have to know you're looking at the fundamental mode. You could have a star that's doing the first overtone or some other mode. And if you don't know that it's fundamental mode, you're not going to get the right answer. So, um, but she's working on, you know, finding ways to distinguish um, modes of stars um, using the data that we're, we're obtaining over time. But yes, you can. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I haven't read her paper yet. It's in monthly notices in 2022. I just got it off the web yesterday. So I need to. I want to see if my stars fit on her diagram or not, and I'm not sure. If sure, that would be nice. <laughs> find out. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. It looks like there's a question in the chat. Right. As Can an amateur, see? how do you measure the star's luminosity? Uh, specifically, what equipment is recommended? Wow. There is a good question. I, they, AAVSO spends a lot of training on this. So um, the way that Richard did uh, measured the star's brightness um, in or luminosity is you basically take a picture of the field and you might have to take a picture um, of, of a, a little bit wider field and you may have to um, keep your aperture open long enough to get enough light in, you know, collect enough light. And then um, you know your star and you can find a comparison star that's fairly constant, you can, do an absolute calibration of the magnitude of your star versus that other star. So that just tells you it's apparent magnitude, right? Because it, a bright star that's far away will look really faint. Um, so then you have to know its distance. And that's where you need more information. And that's where the 
the Gaia spacecraft and before that Hipparchos spacecraft was very useful because it would get a parallax distance to the star. So if you know the distance and you know how, how bright it appears to look, you can get an absolute luminosity. Now there's one more catch and that's interstellar reddening. So there's a lot of cloudy, dusty stuff between us and the stars, especially if it's far away, you could be looking through dust. So then you need to know, um, people have mapped dust clouds or infra, um, in the infrared and other, other things. So they have some estimate of interstellar reddening. And you can also use different color photometry to get an estimate of interstellar reddening. So um, you have to actually include that correction as well. So there's a few steps. But as an amateur, you would basically get a relative apparent magnitude of your star compared to some other star. And then you would have to look up a distance to get the an absolute, pretty good absolute luminosity. And AVSO teaches people how to do this. So you can do it in your backyard. I haven't tried, but, but it's easy. To backyard. And knowing Python is good because that guy was using all this Python software to Richard to process his his CCD image, you know, from his camera. So they have um, Astro Image J, some software you can use that will automatically do stuff for you. So next week, uh, we will be back in the planetarium. Uh, Galen Gisler, who's on here, um, will be doing our presentation on uh, how do we know the ages of stars, galaxies, and the universe. I think I'm missing one. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in that, uh, you can sign up, uh, register online. And um, I want to thank Joyce again for coming and thank all of you for coming to our talk tonight. Thank you. Thanks.